the cloud. Yes, I will do that. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our annual William Stafford birthday celebration and poetry reading. My name is Jennifer and I'm from the Oregon City Library and I'll be co-hosting the event today. Our celebration today will be hosted by Tom Hogan and is sponsored by the Third Monday Authors Group and the Oregon City Public Library. And today we will be celebrating the life and poetry of William Stafford. And now I'll hand it over to Tom Hogan. And I want to thank Jennifer Giovanetti from the Oregon City Library for the opportunity for us to co-sponsor this event and gather together and spend some time in community and really spend some time reading the poems of uh, Bill Stafford, which is a, a wonderful thing. So firstly, big no, thanks sure. to Jen and everything that she's done to make this happen. And the slideshow that we're going to see in a little bit is all her doing. So thank you for that. You're welcome. <laughs> we're also really happy to be here as a third Monday authors group. So our group goes back to originating at Clackamas Community College 20 years ago. And we've been meeting off and on, but mostly on uh, since that time. Some members have come. Uh, we've added new members. Some members aren't able to come uh, all the time. We met at various places and we were meeting in the evening. But we're now meeting uh, on the afternoon on the third Monday. So we are the third Monday authors group. And what we do is we read poetry. Uh, we send poets or poems around to each other and we read them and we get critiquing. So it's a great group and we're really happy to be here and uh, co-sponsoring the event. Uh, just to say a word about Bill Stafford too, just how important he is for us and his works with everything we have going on in the, in the country and in the world today, seems even more important to hear what he has to say and to get together and share them with each other. I know one of the poems that of his that no one is reading today, but it's How I Met My Muse. And he talks about meeting his muse and his muse is his own particular view of the world. And so that's something that we are very fortunate that he did do that and he was able to share that with us. So, how we're going to proceed today is that we have feature readers, and our order of the feature readers are Kelly Wigmore, uh, Ron Stone, June Clapp, me, Will Wigmore, and then Linda Apple. So after we have the, uh, the feature readers, we will uh, have a little bit of time for questions, if there are any questions. And I suppose if anyone does have any questions, we'll turn the chat on and this may be just for you, Nancy. <laughs> if you have any questions, you can put it in the chat, or we'll have just a minute after the featured readers are finished uh, if there are any questions uh, for any of us, for any of us log in between uh, now and then. Uh, then we'll go to the open mic. And I know my lovely wife, Jane, who is sitting here behind me, uh, behind my left shoulder, is going to read a poem. And then we'll, uh, we'll wrap up today. So how we're proceeding is that once a poet is read, a poet's going to read maybe five to seven minutes. Once a poet is read, they're going to introduce the next poet. So it's uh, my pleasure to, uh, to start that off and to introduce our first reader today, who is Kelly Wigbar. And Kelly has been writing poetry since the fourth grade and has appreciated William Stafford for about 40 years. She lives in Oregon City with her husband, Will, and a performing Kurgi. Kelly is a retired English teacher with 36 years of experience and enjoys reading, playing music, and doing volunteer work when there's not a pandemic going on. So would you join me in welcoming our first poet today, Kelly Wigmore. Thank you. Okay. The first poem I'd like to read um, is by William Stafford, and it's one that's called Why I Am Happy. And this is one of my favorite poems of his. Um, and it is, now has come an easy time. I let it roll. 
Okay. But I will switch to my other poem. And it is called Waiting in Line. And this is also by Stafford. And this is a poem that I discovered just, you know, like probably in the last five or six years. Um, and at first it appealed to me because I was working a lot with um, elderly people in nursing homes and senior centers uh, as a volunteer. And it, this poem I thought really spoke to the wisdom um, of, of the elderly. And that's why I liked it at first. It says, you the very old, I have come to the edge of your country and looked across how your eyes warily look into mine as we pass, how you hesitate when we approach a door. Sometimes I understand how steep your hills are and your way of seeing the madness around you, the careless waste of the calendar, the rush of people on buses. I have studied how you carry packages, balancing them better, giving them attention. I have glimpsed from within the gray-eyed look at those who push, and occasionally even I can achieve your beautiful bleak perspective on the loud, the inattentive, shoving boors jostling past you toward their doom. With you, from the pavement I have watched the nation of the young, like jungle birds that scream as they pass or gyrate on playgrounds, their frenzied bodies jittering with the disease of youth. Knowledge can cure them, but not all at once, it will take time. There have been evenings when the light has turned everything silver and like you, I have stopped at a corner and suddenly staggered with the grace of it all. To have inherited all this or even the bereavement of it and finally being cheated, the chance to stand on a corner and tell it goodbye. Every day, every evening, every abject step or stumble has become heroic. You others, we the very old have a country. A passport costs everything there is. And it's just come to me in the last couple of years that at first Stafford's talking about watching the elderly. And at the end, he is the elderly. And I understand that now. I understand that. So the poem has a different meaning for me now, a different level. And this is a poem I wrote that I think sort of explains what I had to learn. It's called Briefly. I am no more than a yellow leaf spiraling to wet ground, a falling star flashing across blackness, a bar of melody humming through silence, an excited wave signaling from a small hand. I know now that my final impact on the world will be of that brevity. When young, I assumed my importance was huge, infinite as the universe, and that despite the proof of physics and history, I would be here forever. Now I am humbled by knowledge of the truth, a speck of dust on a cold spinning rock for a brief moment. May I learn to accept this and strive to leave a beautiful flash of color, light, music, love, since that is all. Beautiful. And the second poem I'd like to share with you by Stafford is um, Why I Am Happy. Now has come an easy time. I let it roll. There is a lake somewhere so blue and far nobody owns it. A wind comes by and a willow listens gracefully. I hear all this every summer. I laugh and cry for every turn of the world. It's terribly cold, innocent spin. That lake stays blue and free. It goes on and on. And I know where it is. It's one of my favorites by Stafford. And, and this one is, that I wrote is very different, but it's, it's, it's alike in that the, the poet has... Um, a place, a, a, an image in their mind that they can go back to, uh, that others may not see, but that they hold and treasure. And this one is called Bobby. A small figure on a bench in front of the home, waiting. Although my mom has been gone for years, that picture is still in my mind. In dreams, I see her waiting for me, 
lonely, hopeful, smiling and waving as my car pulls up. But with time, this picture grows smaller, dimmer, more like a character in a much loved influential book. I still hear her voice at times, harmonizing as I sing, making suggestions when I play Scrabble. Mm -hmm. I miss my mom a lot, but I carry a small cameo of her in my heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you very much. I'm very pleased to have been able to share with you again this year. Thank you, Kelly. Sorry, I had the order wrong. And of course, I got a phone call from the reference desk right as we started. <laughs> it's okay. We worked it out. All right, good. And our next poet is Ron Stone. In 1997, Ron retired from Eastman Chemical Company, where he had managed its employee and family assistance program. As he adjusted to retirement, he began to feel the urge to write poetry. And now, 25 years later, the urge is still there. His poems have appeared online in a year of being here, and one has been translated into Chinese for a Buddhist, Buddhist journal. Last year, he published a volume of his work entitled Something More. After living most of his life in the Eastern US, plus a year in Derby, England, he and his wife moved to West Lynn in 2005. Let's welcome Ron Stone. Thank you, Kelly. Um, by the way, the people in England call it Darby. <laughs> Darby? Darby? Yeah, I don't know why. Um, the poem I want, the first poem I want to read tonight, uh, today is the uh, poem Traveling Through the Dark. It's a favorite of mine, it's a pretty well-known poem and I'm sure many of you know it already. And I, I found in an interview, uh, Stafford delivered uh, to um, some publication, he, he said these words, he said, the speaker of the poem is driving through the dark and stops to clear a dead doe off the narrow highway, but hesitates before pushing the doe down the embankment when he notices that the animal is pregnant and then her unborn fawn is still alive. Though the poem states, I thought hard for us all, Stafford explained to the interviewer that it's not a poem that's written to support a position that I have chosen. It's just a poem that grows out of the, the plight I am in as a human being. That's one of the parts of it that, of that interview that grabs me, that the, the plight he was in as a human being. And I think it, it uh, is, speaks for a, a plight we all get into as human beings at times, uh, having make a difficult choice. Um, the poem goes like this, traveling through the dark. Traveling through the dark, I found a deer dead on the edge of the Wilson River Road. It's usually best to roll them into the canyon. That road is narrow, to swerve might make more dead. By glow of the tail light, I stumbled back of the car and stood by the heap. A doe, a recent killing. She had stiffened already, almost cold. I dragged her off. She was large in the belly. My fingers touching her side brought me the reason. Her side was warm. Her fawn lay there waiting, alive, still never to be born. Beside that mountain road, I hesitated. The car aimed, its, aimed ahead its lowered parking lights. Under the hood purred the steady engine. I stood in the glare of the warm exhaust turning red. Around our group, I could hear the wilderness listening. I thought hard for us all, my only swerving, then pushed her over the edge into the river. Yeah. One of the things that stands out for me in the poem is um, expressed in, in a couple of lines. He said in the first stanza, to swerve might make more dead. 
it doesn't say more people dead or more animals dead, it's just more dead and seems to encompass all of that. <clears throat> and down the, toward the end, it says, I could hear the wilderness listen. Mm -hmm. I thought that's a nice phrase. Mm -hmm. He said, I thought hard for all of us, not just himself, but for all of the wilderness. And then he went on. Um, the, uh, so this thing standing out to me made me think of, of a conversation I had with a friend who lives in British Columbia, who um, has done a lot of writing through the years himself. And he mentioned to me one time that he thought there was one volume that incorporated all of the masterpieces of the English, of English literature. And the volume was the dictionary, if you knew how to arrange it right. <laughs> I, it got me to thinking, I wondered how many poems I could find in the dictionary. <laughs> so I started in with the letter A and I wrote a poem about that and letter B and C and so forth. I'm up to O now, so I'm over the hump. I'm, I'm more than halfway there. But the one I wanted to read to you today is, is the first one. <clears throat> I chose the word abandon a verb to withdraw one's support <clears throat> or help from, especially in spite of duty, allegiance, or responsibility, to desert. There was a time, though you wouldn't remember, when humans lived much like their animal can. They coexisted as equals most of the time. They survived by eating the others old and weak, turning one's flesh into the others. Mm. Time, we humans with our bigger brains gained control. We were no longer us. We became us and them. We abandoned them. And one by one, we made them objects, not kin. Now, one by one, one by one, they cease to exist. Once they're gone, we will see what we missed. The next poem of Stafford's that I wanted to share with you is one he calls Father and Son, um, written about flying a kite, mm -hmm. and made me think about one I had written about flying kites with my children, Amy and David. When they were born, we named each of them in turn, of course, and Amy first, and then couple of years later, David. And it was only after we had done that that we realized both names mean beloved, which I thought was pretty nice. Mm -hmm. um, but Stafford's poem is about the relationship with his son. And uh, he goes like this. No sound, a spell on, on, out, where the wind went. Our kite sent back its thrill along the string that sagged but sang and said, I'm here, I'm here. Till broke somewhere gone years ago, but sailed forever clear of earth. I hold whatever tugs the other end. I hold that string. Mm -hmm. Of course, obviously what holds the other end is the sun. And that's the string he's hanging on to. And it made me think of this, uh, this poem of mine about flying kites with Amy and David. It goes like this. It had been many years since I'd last flown a kite. There was school and then courtship, marriage and work, then two births and infancy. Through those years, it was time that took flight. But one year at the beach, Kitty Hawk, the time had come, it, uh, the time just seemed right to join Wilbur and Orville for a personal flight. Both children launched their own kite with great ease because of the beach's strong, steady breeze. And then I sent my kite up to the skies. I had forgotten the feeling, if ever I knew, 
though I held the ground and <laughs> it felt like I was. Our next reader is June Clapp. June, <clears throat> June began the year writing words and music and songs, some of which are, have been published. And uh, only more recently that she decided to focus more on the words and, and uh, joined our group. And it's been a, a delightful addition. Um, so our next reader then is June Clapp. Ron, I think it's interesting. Uh, this is, <laughs> this talks about a thread. I think that you could uh, call it a string if you'd like. But <laughs> this is a William Stafford poem called The Way It Is. I'm glad it followed what you just said. Mm. There's a thread you follow. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you are pursuing. You have to explain about the thread, but it is hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen, people get hurt or die, and you suffer and get old. Nothing you do can stop times unfolding. You don't ever let go of the thread. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought that was interesting that uh, compare some, sometimes it does feel like the thread is, we're hanging on, like hanging on to a kite as it swings us around through life. <laughs> okay, the next one I have is a ritual to read to each other. If you don't know the kind of person I am, and I don't know the kind of person you are, a pattern that others made may prevail in the world and following the wrong God home, we may miss our star. For there is many a small betrayal in the mind, a shrug that lets the fragile sequence break, sending with shouts the horrible errors of childhood storming out to play through the broken dike. And as elephants parade, holding each other's, each elephant's tail, but if one wanders, the surface won't find the park. I call it cruel, and maybe the root of all cruelty, to know what occurs, but not recognize the fact. And so I appeal to a voice, to something shadowy, a remote, important region in all who talk. Though we could fool each other, we should consider lest the parade of our mutual life get lost in the dark. For it is important that awake people be awake, or breaking line may discourage them back to sleep. The signals we give, yes, no, or maybe, should be clear. The darkness around us is deep. <coughs> then the light by the barn. The light by the barn that shines all night pales at dawn when a little breeze comes. A little breeze comes breathing the fields from their sleep and waking the slow windmills. The slow windmill sings the, day long, the long day about anguish and loss to the chickens at work. The little breeze follows the slow windmill and the chickens at work till the sun goes down than the light by the barn again. Uh, I like, I like this last one called Just Thinking because I'm sure there are many times, there are many times for all of us when uh, you make your own space <coughs> instead of uh, letting your mind travel elsewhere, you go within. Just thinking by William Stafford. Got up on a cool morning, leaned out the window. No cloud, no wind, air that flowers held for a while. Some dove somewhere. Been on probation most of my life, and the rest of my life been condemned 
So these moments count for a lot. Peace, you know. Let the bucket of memory down into the well. Bring it up. Cool, cool minutes. No one stirring. No plans. Just being there. This is what the whole thing is about. That's one of my favorites. I like that one. Thank you. Thank you, June. Beautiful, thank you. Are you going to introduce me? Oh, sure. Yes, I'd, I'd be honored. Okay. So Tom, Tom Hogan. Tom Hogan's latest book, Giving Thanks, New and Selected Poems, was published by Dancing Moon Press in 2018. He is the author of five chapbooks and the, and the Promise of the Rail, also by Dancing Moon Press 2014. He coordinates the Milwaukee Poetry Series, currently in its 15th season. He is an LCSW with a part-time private practice and lives with his wife, Jane, in Milwaukee, Oregon. Thank you very much, Jen. You're welcome. And it's so nice to be able to read Bill Stafford's poems. And I'm going to start with one of my favorites. I have a lot of favorites, actually. <laughs> and Jane and I, about six years ago or so, took a trip to the Dakotas. And the reason we went there was that my mother was born in Rolla, North Dakota which is a little town about 10 miles, 10 miles from the Canadian border, north of Bismarck. And one of the things that they have within easy driving distance is the International Peace Arch, which we went to. And this isn't, that isn't exactly what Bill Stafford is talking about in this poem, but I definitely thought about that when we were there at the Peace Arch. This is at the Unnational Monument along the Canadian border. This is the field where the battle did not happen, where the unknown soldier did not die. This is the field where grass joined hands, where no monument stands, and the only heroic thing is the sky. Birds fly here without any sound, unfolding their wings across the open. No people killed, or were killed on this ground, hallowed by neglect in an air so tame that people celebrate it by forgetting its name. At the Young National Monument along the Canadian border. So this seems to me talking about an alternative, a peace alternative, which would be wonderful if we achieve. The second Bill Stafford poem that I want to read is kind of along that line, uh, talking about war, because we know he was a pacifist and did alternative service during the Second World War. This is explaining the big one. Remember that leader with the funny mustache? Liked flags and marching, gave loyalty a bad name. Didn't drink, they say, but liked music and was jolly, sometimes. And then there was the one with the big mustache and the wrinkled uniform, always jovial for the camera, but eliminated malcontents by the millions. He was our friend, I think. Women? Oh yes, women. They danced and sang for the soldiers or volunteered their help. We love them, except Tokyo Rose. Didn't we kill her afterward? Our own leaders, the jaunty cigarette holder, the one with the cigar. Remember the pearl handled revolver? And Ike, who played golf. It was us against the bad guys then. You should have been there explaining the big one. So I've heard people say, hey, it's always daunting to read your poems after you've read Bill Stafford's. And I have to say, I agree with that. I'm gonna read uh, the first one of mine. 
And this was written at a, this was written about the Ascension Monastery in Idaho. So Jane and I have gone over there for 25 years now. We didn't go in 2020 because of the pandemic. Uh, we did go for just one night this last year. But we went over there for elder hostels and Jane was part of the program. And we met a dear, made a dear friend there, Father Abner von Gardner, who was a monk at Ascension, which is near Twin Falls. So this poem is on St. Andrew's Day, November 30th, for, Saint An for Father Andrew Baumgartner. I gazed at your smiling face across the table at the monastery in Jerome, Idaho, wondering how long you will be with us. You were concerned about your pacemaker. Your heart medicine slowed you down, you said, and you couldn't hike the Pacific Crest Trail again, having done it twice with Augusto to belied your physique. Try the Idaho Overland Trail, I said, across the strait. It's right here in Idaho, and you don't need to travel to California or Oregon. You could do it from the monastery in bits and pieces. It's a beginning, I said, just like the new liturgical year in November. There's a celebration in Scotland on your feast day of St. Andrew, commemorating the end of the old and the beginning of the new. I may have imagined it now that you're gone, but I believe I detected the slightest glimmer in your eye on St. Andrew, Andrew's Day uh, for Father Andrew Bonnegrader. And I'm gonna finish uh, with another one of mine. This is my day at Mount Rainier National Park. We love the national parks, so go every opportunity we can. I got up, I worried about my tooth. We checked out breakfast, too expensive. The Paradise Lodge was gorgeous in its varnished wood. It was raining, so no hiking. We couldn't see the mountain. The climbers came back in full gear. The summit was socked in. We got a newspaper. Two children died in South Sudan. Protesters overran the Hong Kong streetcar. There was still crime in the city. I thought about God. Life is in the details, I thought. I listened to a Neil Young interview. You don't know the light is gone till it comes back. My wife said, you should write that down. My day at Mount Rainier National Park. Thank you very much. Um. So our next poet, our next poet is Will Whitmore, Kelly's husband. Originally from Rockaway Beach, New York City, Will says he left the East Coast at age 20. I have always enjoyed poetry after discovering, discovering Jack Kerouac, Dylan, Bob and the Welshman, Billy Collins, Lao Tse, E. e. Cummings, Sarah Teasdale, Kenneth Rockroth, Gary Snyder, Florence Ferlinghetti. I retired from teaching middle school eight years ago. Met my wife, Kelly, playing Irish music. <laughs> playing Irish music. Let's welcome our next poet, Will Wilmore. Wigmore. Um, hi, thank you. I hope you can hear me. So I, I told, chose two William Stafford poems that I just discovered recently. I find I'm always discovering new William Stafford poems. Um, there seems to be so many. Um, this one is called With the Neighbors One Afternoon. Someone said, stirring their tea, I would come home any time just for this, to look out the clear backyard air, and then into the cup, onto the cup. You could see the tiniest pattern of bark in the trees, and every single angle of color change. In the sunshine, millions of miles of gold light lavished on people like us. You could put your hand out and feel the rush of years, rounding your life into these days of ours. 
Mountains. And somewhere a leaf came gliding slowly down and rested on the lawn. Remember that scene? Inside it, you folded the last of your jealousy and hate, and all those deeds so hard to forget. Absolution, swish. You took the past into your mouth and swallowed it, warm, thin, bitter, and good. And this other one I discovered in an anthology just the other night, and you can I could really hear William Safford's voice in this, um, and the quirky title even Saint Matthew and all, by William Safford. Loreen, we thought she'd come home, but it got late, and then days. Now it has been years. Why shouldn't she? If she wanted, I would. Something comes along sunny day. You start walking. You meet a person who says, follow me. And things lead on. Mm -hmm. Usually it wouldn't happen. But sometimes the neighbors notice your car is gone. A patch of oil in the driveway and it fades. They forget. In the Bible it happened. Fishermen, Levites, they just went away and kept going. Thomas, away off in India, never came back. But Lorraine, it was a stranger maybe, and he said, your life, I need it. And nobody else did. Wow. Thank you, Will. You gonna read your last two? Yeah, I, and um, there they are, and I just threw the, these are new. I don't know if you've noticed the the, the Tualatin River looks like a raging rapid right now. And I took a little walk and came up with haikus. I used to teach my I taught seventh grade for a number of years, and I taught the kids the five seven five method, which is sort of a bastardized version of Japanese haiku. But um, oh, they'd go around for days doing things in five seven five. So I stop now. Um, Haiku, La Nina winter, Tualatin River up, muscular rapids, swirling around the cottonwoods and maple roots, brown and dangerous. Droplets of sunlight, reflected orbs and rose hips, to the land, onto the Columbia and the tongue of the salt sea, river high and fast. What cares this river? This river has no concern. Herons wait for spring. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah. Very nice. And this this is um, something I, I picked up my daughter at Amtrak on 12 10 21. This is a song of rain and of a train on the shortest day of the year. The light returning, it is said. And let me say, too, it is sad. I prefer it be brighter sooner. The rain, the train, the light. I suppose I'll watch it pass by. Or better yet, sleep through the darkness. This rain, this train, this light, this night. Nice. Nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. You, you bet. Thank you. Um, now I'm going to introduce Linda when I pull it up on my phone. There it is. Are we ready for that? Okay. okay. Linda Knowlton Apple is an adopted Oregonian. Although she has lived all around the United States, after studying in New York City and Ashland, Wisconsin, she received a master's degree in library science from the University of California at Berkeley. She worked for many years in scientific and industrial libraries before retiring to concentrate on writing poetry. Her work has appeared in various publications, including Willow Law Journal, Voice Catcher, and Chrysalis, Emer Chrysalis Emerging Women Writers. And she has published two chapbooks, Latitudes of the Heart and Exclaiming to the Sky. Mother of two and a grandmother, she and her husband have lived beside the Willamette River for more than 40 years. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Um, although we try uh, to avoid this, it has happened. The poem that I chose, one of the poems that I'm choosing to read has already been read today. And I thought, since you're not going to be able to read the poems from the screen due to my own <laughs> problems with the computer, I think, um, I could have just chosen another one on the fly, but I, it never hurts to read, a set, read it a second time. Right. The one that I first wanted to begin with is The Way It Is. And I realized when we, came, we began planning this that rather than reading through everything I could get my hands on all the will in Stafford, which I usually do, I knew exactly what I wanted to read. And it was this poem, P partially because I realized that my own writing over this past year has concentrated traded so much on trying to find that thread that is runs through my life. Here is William Stafford, the way it is. There's a thread you follow. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you are pursuing. You have to explain about the thread but it is hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen, people get hurt or die, and you suffer and get old. Nothing you do can stop times unfolding. You don't ever let go of the thread. Mm -hmm. The uh, The poem I, of my own that I chose to uh, relate, relate it immediately to this for me. I looked at this poem this year and I thought, well, what is Stafford's thread? What is my thread? What, what is, thread is he talking about? Is it words, the words we learn as children, the words we share, the words that we puzzle over is it uh, what is it that is that thread so with that in mind my poem is entitled for a grandson's birthday mm. in covid times we must stay distant from our own kin our own kind and so i am wrapping birthday gifts that must be sent today because the mail is slow, so very slow. While working, I look at a recent photo of this youngest grandchild and catch his mother's face smiling back at me. I'm charmed by him, an elfin mass of potential wrapped in the mysterious package of genetic instructions. Donations from his mother and father and from their mothers and fathers reaching back millennia. I consider and reconsider various resemblances, but no, this child is unique. We may be momentarily confused, thinking we see his mom, dad, or great uncle, but I know he is fully himself, one self, lone and new, exploring his singular gifts, and I know him to be a gift to us and to tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. The uh, next poem that I wanted to read was uh, not quite as familiar. I know I've read it before, but I didn't remember it. And I maybe it will be new to you. It's entitled, You Reading This, Be Ready. Hmm. Starting here, what do you want to remember? How sunlight creeps along a shining floor? What scent of old wood hovers? What softened sound from outside 
fills the air? Will you ever bring a better gift for the world than the breathing respect that you carry wherever you go right now? Are you waiting for time to show you some better thoughts? When you turn around, starting here, lift this new glimpse that you found. Carry into evening all that you want from this day. This interval you spent reading or hearing this, keep it for life. What can anyone give you greater than now, starting here, right in this room, when you turn around? Mm -hmm. And the uh, poem I, I wrote that I would share with you at this point is entitled, What If? What if I had gone? What if I had tried? What if I had studied? What might have happened? Where would I be? Who could I have connected with? All the oughts and what ifs of my life line up behind me these days. For years, they have jostled at my back. They've jeered and called the cats that howl around me in the night. But now I have begun to tame them. In fact, I've grown rather fond of them, finely etched and a bit grotesque, like gory drawings. I pat them on their heads, consoling them for what they did not get to do. I'm so sorry we haven't hiked the Cornwall coast, but maybe we can still tour the Lake District. I know I should have studied Reiki, but let's practice yoga this morning. <laughs> yes, I should have sewn and quilted and cross-stitched more, but today, together we can teach a niece. Many opportunities did not bear fruit. Many possibilities were stunted, but this life has been rich, full and remarkable, and I am content. And I would like to end by reading one last short Stafford poem. Yes, by William Stafford. It could happen any time, tornado, earthquake, Armageddon, it could happen. Or sunshine, love, salvation. It could, you know. That's why we wake and look out. No guarantees in this life, but some bonuses like morning, like right now, like noon, like evening. <laughs> yes, by William Stafford. Thank you very much, Linda. Thank you. Yes, well, what a great poem to end mm -hmm. the uh, feature reader portion of our event today. It could happen. It could happen. It could happen. Yeah. COVID has happened. Yeah. But <laughs> Lots of things happen. Yes. <laughs> There's no question about that. Before we hear from Jane in the open mic, let's just see if there are any questions that any of us have. Do any of us have a question for each other? Or does Jen have any? Or I was going to open this up to the open mic. And so that means Nancy and Jane. Are there anything that anybody particularly wants to answer or wants to ask? Well, I don't have any questions, but I have to say, having done this last year and now again this year, each time I come out of this feeling just so hopeful and happy and it's just wonderful. So thank you all so much. It kind of brings tears to my eyes and to the, the poems about the strings and the threads um, those are very special poems, I think. And we had um, in my family, a person pass away this past year. And uh, my sister-in-law, who is very young and has three young children, and the chaplain at her service read a story for the kids um, about a string that connects everyone and especially to your loved ones. And so this was wow. very special. Thank you. Wow. wow. Thank you, Jen. Wow. Sorry for your loss. Oh, thank you. Well, should we hear from uh, the open mic reader? 
<laughs> yes. Singular well, reason. let's move into the Yay. open mic <laughs> section of, of the event. And let's hear from my lovely wife, Jane. Do you, do you want to move a little closer? Yeah. Well, Tom gave me this book the way it is. I know you're all familiar with it. And I just opened to the last page. So these are two poems on the very last page of the book. The first one is how these words happened. In winter, in the dark hours, when others were asleep, I found these words and put them together by their appetites and respect for each other. In stillness, they jostled. They traded meanings while pretending to only have one. Monstrous alliances never dreamed of before began. Sometimes they last. Never again do they separate in this world. They die together. They have a fidelity that no purpose or pretense can ever break. And all this happens like magic to the words in those dark hours when others sleep. And then this is the first poem that I opened this book to called Vita. God guided my hand and it wrote, forget my name. World, please note a life went by, just a life, no claims. A stutter in the million of stars that pass, a voice that lulled, a glance and a world and a hand. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Jane, for, for reading in the, uh, the open mic. And I want to share that I, I agree with Jim that in leaving these events, I feel hopeful and, and good. So I am always glad that we do it. I'm always glad to hear Bill Stafford's words. They are, they're deep, they're deep, but accessible. Mm -hmm. And things that I think that, that we can relate to, certainly at least uh, I do. And getting together and sharing them in a community like this just really seems so important. So I am glad we do it. <laughs> and, uh, I am as well. Yeah, a big yeah, thanks yeah. to uh, everybody in our group and and to Jen. I, I Thank think you, you to you all. Yeah, you, you did a lot today. Okay, oh, my pleasure. <laughs> we should give we should give Jen a hand. Oh no no no! Yeah. It's Thank my you. pleasure. Thank you for bringing the poetry. Yeah. And, uh, and and doing this event every year. It's very special. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I sent things off to Jen and like with Kelly's poems and said, can you do this? And there was, I don't know, an hour and a half or so, you know, before we were, we were going to uh, read. And Jen says, of course, sure. <laughs> so she did it. <laughs> I noticed I missed part of one of the poems. I, I think I cut it short. One of the ones June read, but Hopefully, uh, we got to hear her read it. So it yeah, didn't yes, matter that yeah. it wasn't on the screen. <laughs> yeah, maybe I didn't send all of that to you. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, because there was there were some some lines missing at the end of a ritual to read. To oh, yeah. Yeah, but we did get to hear her read it. Yes, it was lovely. Okay. Is there, is there anything any of anybody else wants to share? How you're feeling before we sign off? I just hope that next year we can, I can remember to invite more people to get, have more people around to share this with us. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's much easier to accomplish when it's in person. It's so hard these days to get people to <laughs> willingly go on to zoom <laughs> yes it is getting we're, we're all zoomed out <laughs> mm -hmm. yes well i want to thank you for inviting me thank you for inviting me i always love it when we have um share poetry at saint francis church what we used to do and uh so thank you for letting me listen to all your your reading and also your own poems so it gives me inspiration
Yeah. So, thank you. As well as speakers. I'm sorry. Say that again, Ron. We missed it. I said we need listeners as well as speakers. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> well, we appreciate you coming, Nancy. Yes. Yes. So, thank you for just to, you know keeping putting putting the uh, the invitations out there. And thank you. That would be great. Talking to people and inviting them and and see who comes. Yeah. We'll do it again next year. Sounds good. Yeah. If there's the same time next year. I yes. think that was a show I remember seeing. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Okay. So right. We'll see our group tomorrow. Yeah. Tomorrow, tomorrow too. Two o'clock. Two o'clock. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, Jen. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Will. Yeah. Have a great afternoon. Hey, thanks for being here, Will, and for joining. We'll see you. Bye-bye, everyone. Yeah, bye. Bye-bye. Okay.